just one okay, just one of the reasons these tables and everything are all set up is because on Tuesday nights we've been Why doing didn't trivia, we clap? and we have one more session next Tuesday, and I know that most all the people, all the people that have come have enjoyed it. Very casual, fun, hour and fifteen minutes. So be on the team. Everybody says I don't know any trivia. Well, when you're on the team, between the four of you and the three of you, you can answer all those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until next week to see what the movie prize is. <laughs> uh, before we start, I just wanted to read something that um, I'm just trying to read it. In case there are many who like to of the legend of Bob and Wang. Just relax for a while in comfort and style and learn how the story began. This beautiful spot by the side of the lake in Melbourne has all the maps show, but many live near in whose memory tis clear. Barbel Wang was its name years ago. Now the Bible, they say, is a kind of fish. They abound in the lake and the streams. The fishermen came from the neighboring towns and caught them with spears by the reins. They caught them by day, they caught them by night. They say it was quite a profession. Quite often they drank from a hot cider jug and to some it became an obsession. All were happy and gay by the end of the day. They could never use all their babble. So what did they do? Indeed we'll tell you and let you all wonder and marvel. Some threw them on porches as homeward they sped. The Bible fell there with a bang. Some tossed them in fields through which the past led, and they called as they passed, Bible Wang. <laughs> Thus the town became known, Bible Wang, far and wide. Should you send through the mail any day a letter or card with the words, Bible Wang, it would reach Melvin Village, they say. That was written by um, Ray Hansen. <coughs> David may remember the boys. I can't remember their names. They lived, I think, where Fenton Bonnie lives. Now. No. Those are the, those are the no, no relation. No relation. So, anyway, last night in, in our trivia, one of the questions was, what is a bobble? So... And I knew I had this poem, so I thought, okay. I didn't get it. We didn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. Um, I'm going to introduce one at a time some of our people who volunteered to tell a little bit about what they remember growing up. And they can either sit where they are and tell what they remember or what they want to do, or they can go up, and um, some of them, I think, have some slides or good stories or whatever. So first on the, um, my list is John and Gowen, who um, spent summers at Hallwood Camp. John. <laughs> And Susie, just for your information, this is for <laughs> Well, actually, I wasn't going to be the person speaking because I, I am what you would call a newbie. Um, I have only been here for 20 years. <laughs> um, but um, I live at Westwood Bay, and uh, Cynthia Dearborn was unable to come tonight. She was going to tell you, but she, since she was five years old, went to Hallwood Lodges. And if you see up there, uh, that's the actual sign that hung and uh, uh, there. Uh, and right here, and I'll pass this around so everybody can see it, but right here are the two people who started Hallwood Lodges at the halls. And um, uh, one of the things that you may not know about this property is when you look at the crib dock, that is the dock where all the cows left.
to go to Cal Island when they came over on the barges and things. So uh, we are currently uh, researching back how the property got to where, uh, where we are today. Westwood Bay was actually started in uh, 1973 by Henry Maxfield. And he got six people to buy um, in. And then they, uh, there were seven cottages and they sold one after that. But he got six people to buy in so they could buy the property. And uh, it has, so since 1949, it has been in constant use as uh, a summer vacation. They're all seasonal cottages. They open May 1st and they close October 30th. Um, but you will see that. So I'll just pass this around so you can see that. But um, a couple things that I wanted to tell you about was um, Albert and Lillian, and her name was Billy Hall from Bronxville, New York. And they had always enjoyed their summers up here. And so they bought the property and started with a um, built one cottage, thinking that they were going to just be cottage dwellers themselves. And um, Albert ended up not coming up very often. He was working too much. And so Billy was very lonely, so they built another cottage and rented it out. And then they built another cottage, and then they built another cottage, and then they built another cottage, and it just kept going like that. Um, those of you who probably have seen the sign, we're in between 19 Mile Bay and 20 Mile Bay, and Westwood Bay is the burgundy sign with the sailboat on it. So you've probably passed by many, many times. Um, so, the one thing that's really important is the, um, the following improvements were made. First, they filled in the middle waterfront section, which was swampy. Uh, I don't think we would do that today. <laughs> uh, I don't think we'd get the permit, right? But, and then they built a small dock. They had the jetty built over uh, what was the crib of the old steamship dock. Uh, they had two areas which were sand, one with the dock entrance towards uh, cottage six and the other from the jet grassed over. And then they built two patios, flagstone, and a beautiful grass lawn. And you know who loves our beautiful grass lawn. They go by. Oh, oh. Yep, <laughs> you got it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, uh, after the Halls retired, the property was bought by Robert Dawson in the name of uh, Cambry Associates, and he continued to rent out all the, co the six of the cottages. There's actually seven cottages, and then the eighth building is a laundry room, a workshop, and a ping pong room. So there's lots of, lots of space. And then um, Henry Maxfield entered the, uh, the thing. And uh, they were uh, actually bought it. And they did something that's a little bit different, and I don't know if anybody would do it today. But there were six owners, so they put each cottage number in of the hat, and they each chose. Well, very, very different way of, you know, but, uh, and uh, uh, the first one came, his name was uh, Fred O'Gow, and most of you know Fred from Avery Insurance. Okay, and he chose cottage three, um, he and his wife, Jet. And then the second was cottage one, and that was cho chosen by Bob and Wilma Marvin, who used to run the dock cider. And then uh, cottage four went to Henry and Betty Maxfield, cottage six went to Howard Yu, and uh, cottage five went to Bill and Mary Foote, and then uh, cottage seven went to Douglas and Betty Kip. And then, they sold Cottage 2, and that's where I live now, uh, to uh, Peter and Mary Ann Beth Walker, who were residents from Philadelphia. So um, the interesting thing is, okay, uh, these cottages, of course, were built in the late 1940s, early 50s. Um, so that means they've been in constant use for almost 70 years. So they're an integral part of the Tufton Borough. Uh, cottage uh, uh, 2 was uh, Bland Barkham, uh, and then we bought it. Cottage four uh, was Maxfield, and then uh, John and Jenny Muller, and then uh, Bob and Nancy Ebersole bought it. Cottage five had a lot of people 
<laughs> uh, the foot's foot at first, and then uh, the uh, abbots, and then uh, Peter and Ellen Goodall, I don't know if you remember them, the, the dentists, uh, Bill and Evelyn Waterhouse, uh, David and Joe Northey, and Steve and Paula Spratt, and then Ross and Michelle Abbott. Ross is Paul and Jet Abbott's son, so it's now back in the family. And then Cottage 6, uh, the Hughes sold it to Fran and B. Paris. And then Cottage 7, uh, Kip sold it to John and Liz uh, Dearborn. Right now, Cottage 1 is owned by, still owned by Martins. It's the four kids own it. Cottage um, 6 is owned by uh, Fran and B.'s daughter, so it's still in the family. Uh, Cottage 7 is owned by Cynthia and her brother John. Who, uh, Dearborn, so it's still in the family. So it's really nice to see that uh, it's continued all along. Um, and of course, the O'Dowds also still it's in the family. So uh, that was uh, that's worked out really nice. Uh, so in 1973, Westwood Bay became uh, the owners, and they added uh, they extended the dock so that each uh, cottage had the dock. They uh, dug an artesian well, they repaved the main road down to the cottages, and they installed a new uh, and improved septic system that's big enough probably for half of Tuckenborough, but that's what they require these days, even though we're only there three or four months. Uh, uh, so, uh, but it goes back to Albert and uh, Billy Hall, and uh, I think one of the things that you'll see there, you'll see the two girls, Cynthia and her sister are the two girls that you see in most of the pictures. And those were uh, actual pictures they took as they came every summer uh, to here. And I guess uh, Billy was known because she was probably the only one who would go in to the Piper store and say, Ernest! <laughs> so, um, but, because uh, uh, she was very proper. So, uh, but uh, so there's a lot of things, uh, that are going on, and I am uh, donating, well, Westwood Bay is donating the pictures, so the museum will have that, and the history, and maybe, just maybe, we could do one of the present, one of the uh, bulletin boards, like we have the bowling alley now, we could do cottages, because between, uh, all along that 109, there are a lot of cottages that, some are still in uh, business, and uh, are operating, and some are, uh, changed over to full-time houses. And I just have to make a quick, this is now at the Tuftonboro Library. It is Cruising New Hampshire History, A Guide to New Hampshire's Roadside, Roadside Historical Markers. It is very, very good. It talks about the uniqueness of all New Hampshire. So even though I'm a Jersey girl, I love New Hampshire. Thank you. <laughs> And it was about 45 years now. So when we had children, you wanted to take them to the beach. So we would go up to Union Walk, Melbourne Walk. Yeah, I don't even know the road. I just go. <laughs> but and we were welcomed there by three ladies. We were welcomed by Sarah Grupp, Diane Harrington. And Marilyn Black, and it didn't matter whether you were a town resident or a summer resident or just here for two weeks, they always greeted you with hi, how are you, and a hug, and welcome to our beach. And the beach 
was given to the town by Priscilla Hughes. Hughes, right? Hodges, I mean, sorry, Hodges. Um, she presented, from what I have been told, that small area of the beach that has been Melbourne Beach. And the swimming lessons were there for the kids. And we would pack our lunch. And swimming lessons started some of them at 8 o'clock in the morning. And we would be there from 8 o'clock in the morning, some of us, until 8 at night. Because <laughs> we didn't, we'd go home and we'd get supper and we'd bring it back. And we'd just stay and we practically lived on the beach. I had a husband who was working in Massachusetts. So it was just the boys and myself that were here. So it didn't matter where we had supper. And some of the other residents that were summer residents, they did the same thing. They could stay and they would go home. So we decided to form a club since we were always there. And we said, well, this is just like we were on vacation someplace. So we called it Club Melbourne. And the Swains, who were summer residents at the time, Ken designed a shirt for us. And this is just one of many. This was, as you can tell, but it's Melbourne. And we wore them every place. But it was almost like a family. And it, like I say, it was made up of both residents and summer residents. But all of our children played together. There was no fighting. Any parent who spoke to a child and corrected them, I said, the child minded immediately. It wasn't a question of, you're not my mother. I don't have to mind you. It was a very respectful thing. And what really made it even more so was Nori and Ted Hawkins, who owned the three red cottages right down there. They were fantastic. They welcomed the kids. Nori had the best rule ever. She had a barn and it was full of toys. It was full of bats and balls and shovels and pails and everything under the sun. And her rule was, you can take whatever you want out of the barn, play with it, but it had to be put back. Because if she had to pick it up, it got put in her other box and you didn't get it till next year. <laughs> and all of the kids followed that rule. And if one of the kids didn't, you'd find another child would pick it up and put it away because they didn't want it taken away. And it was such a family-oriented feel down there, the Club Melbourne, that all the kids grew up and the friendships they formed those years <coughs> have been true friendships and they have continued on and their children are now friends with their kids coming up. But we did things together. We went roller skating. We went on the Winnipesaukee Bell um, as families. We went up the castle in the clouds for a party. <coughs> and you didn't do it as an individual. You did it as a group. And it was always a warm and welcoming feel. And today, if you go down to the beach, there's not, I haven't met a person who is there all the time, like we were, but you've got a new beach. Now, I haven't been to that one. I'm partial to this one. <laughs> so I don't know what goes on down there. But up here, they will still be friendly. And even the ones that are too, you know, you're only here for two weeks or you're only here for a day, you still get the warm welcome that you feel. I'm not so sure the kids will all mind you. But my kids say that I don't know enough to keep quiet. I'm going to tell the kids when they're doing something wrong anyway. But it is such a, that's the one thing that I have always appreciated about Tuffnerville is the feel of family and closeness. And it doesn't matter where you are or who you meet. They're always friendly and they're always willing to say hi and to go to bat for you. If you need help, I have to ask. Somebody who's sure to help you. And Club Melbourne, really, the kids still want to get together and have more t-shirts made. <laughs> yes. What, what years approximately were those? 
Uh, let's see. I would say 80, maybe 85, <laughs> late 70s. Well, um, I know Ben was born in 81. Nathan was born in 75, and I didn't bring Nathan there as an infant. So I think Nathan must have been three or four. So I would, my feeling is back in the, the, um, Early 80s when we called it Club Melody. I haven't got Ken's drawing. Um, the earlier ones he didn't put a date on. But this one was in the 90s. And uh, so I think it was, I'm almost sure that the first Club Melvin was back in the 80s. Early 80s. But we did have good times. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm the token non melting person here tonight, I'm not sure. Um, I live in the Mirror Lake area, you know where that is? It's okay. <laughs> store and it was also the post office and for sure all of you know but in case there's someone new who doesn't know where it used to be if you're going on 109 you come to Tufton Burl Neck Road that's right near the Mirror Lake Church the first if you head down Tufton Burl Neck the first house the building on the left was the post office and the store and I first met Ernie when I was really little I came up here for five years and spent the first five years I was a baby until five years old, um, up at my grandparents' farm on 109A in Wolfboro, next to Hersey Cemetery. And then my mom bought a uh, camp that was built in the 30s down on uh, a dirt road. We now call it Bixby Shore, but it's off of Chase Point Road, and it's still a one-lane road. And now it has a sign. Remember we all had, had hung the signs with our names on it? Yeah, that changed. Well, going back to, going back to Ernie's, um, so I first met Ernie. Probably uh, 1950, and when we—that's when we bought our two-bedroom camp on the lake. And what I remember was we, my two bro older brothers and I, had a really, really good fortune to leave northern New Jersey, where I grew up, the day after school got out, get in the car, and come all the way up here, and not go back until the day after Labor Day. And my grandchildren said. You're kidding, the entire summer here? I said, yes. <laughs> so, anyway, um, when we would arrive, we'd you know, go in and get a few things. He only had some real basic staples there. Um, but the first thing Ernie would say, and he was a rotund guy and just always with a smile and just a happy person, he would say, oh, summer has begun. The holes have arrived. That was my mentioning. So we, we're always greeted with a huge, huge smile. Um, I think Jackie was saying, try to remember some of the things. Okay, the thing I remember most, and remember I was pretty little, I would walk in the door and they had, he had two screen doors, you know, he had a double door, and the doors always creaked, screen doors always creaked. <laughs> then you walk in and there was a counter and so forth, but over on the left hand side against the wall was this big cooler. You know the old fashioned coolers where you slid the door open? and you've got the Coke or whatever it was, whatever you're allowed to have, then they had a little way you opened up the cap and you had gone to him. It was just <laughs> wonderful. Now my husband, who did not, we did not get married until the mid 60s, said he seems to remember Ernie had donut holes, but I'm not sure of that. The other thing, um, the other things I remember that um, he always had, of course, were the mailboxes. When you walked in the stores to the right, now they were over in the museum and the old fashioned wooden mailboxes and that was just super fun because I thought it was really neat. You could look in and if he was behind them you could see it. You know, he was I just I don't know. Lots of things for a little kid was a lot of fun. Um, let's see. The 
thing I think I remember most was he didn't have that much food because you're expected to go into the big town of Wolfboro to get food. I mean, he had a, a variety of food. But I remember exactly where the cookies were <laughs> and the canned peaches. Don't ask me why. I always said to my mom, are we going to get some cookies? She said, no, I think I'll make some. No, mom, let's get some cookies. So we were lucky if I got graham crackers. Um, Ernie always knew what was going on in town. And he would tell you whether you asked or not. So he was a great source of information. Um, the other thing was, I know that I was, he had written, and we have it in the museum, a little booklet on the Tuffy Borough Post Offices. Very interesting. So I found out by reading that book that the first post office in Year Lake was opened in 1888. But he said in the book, that the postmistress ahead of him, I guess she was a postmaster, I don't know, um, really kind of hung on. She was 88 when she gave up being, well, she died. And, <laughs> and, and, but she was hanging on. Bernie said he, she was hanging on. So he was going to be old enough to be, to be appointed a postmaster. I have no idea what the age was, but that was 1936. Now, to me, Ernie always died really young, but I'm starting to think. I don't think he died until I didn't. I tried to get a hold of the fairs on Top of Girl Neff to see if they knew what day, you know, what day he died. But anyway, I think he died in the 70s um, of diabetes. And I know that that seemed really young to me. So I think he may have been in the 60s. And that's when I was in my 30s, I thought that. Not now, when I'm uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, he was just, um, he gave up, he gave up the post office probably I'm trying to remember back, because at that point we were living out in the Midwest, and we'd come here for our two-week vacation. I think he gave up the about four years before he passed away, and they built the new post office that's about a half mile down uh, down the road. But his general store was still there, and it was really sad. We couldn't go there anymore, and now it's just someone's home, and it's just, you know, not the same. But it's, um, I go by, and I see the memorial at the end a little garden at the end of the road, and I think all of us who live in Muir Lake know that he was uh, a very frugal guy, but he left a surprisingly a large amount of money to Muir Lake Church. I mean, they built the, the cellar downstairs and everything. Um, so I never even knew that he was going to Muir Lake Church, but then I wouldn't have. Um, I think the biggest thing that I loved about coming up here, Ernie was the epitome of people, as Norma mentioned, who were just really, really friendly. And I always felt that here we were up here, we were only here for 10 or 11 weeks. Well, I could not complain about that one at all. But it was as though you lived here. I mean, my God, you're almost a native. I mean, I've been here so long. Am I a native? No, I know. I wasn't born here. But it's, his store was just to me, and I hate to see even the store in Melbourne, which has a store closed down too. It was just, Part of a easier, slower, friendly, just a super friendly town type of place to go to. And I really, really loved it. And considering that I grew up 20 miles from New York City, as you can imagine, I still love telling my friends, we are up here now for nine months of the year. Still like telling my friends, yeah, where we live, there are no stoplights. <laughs> yeah, stop sign, but no stoplight. You're kidding me. Oh, it's wonderful. So anyway, I, I, I love the picture we have on the front of this little pamphlet he wrote of Ernie because that's typical with all his signs outside. The, the U.S. Post Office New York sign is up there, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. So I'm glad I had a chance to talk about the really good section of Tough and Girl. <laughs> <laughs>
but if you're under six months or over 90, you have a note from one of your parents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this other one was, uh, it was talking about the quality of his products. He said that the sign said, if you want the best oats for your horse, it will cost money. If you're willing to settle for oats that have already passed through a horse. He did have done it all. I sort of mail. Okay, I delivered mail for a while around, like, that was one of my stops when I would sort mail with him. And I would, once, well, once in a while, I was kind of out of date. He was looking. <laughs> um, I have the Ernest B. Piper groceries and stuff signs that I got on eBay. Oh, me. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's what the characters are talking about eBay. At least it's staying in the area. Yeah. Yeah. Came back to the area from Boston. Um, any other questions or comments about Mary Piper? David? Vlad? Yeah. All right, David. <laughs> I'm David Blatt, and I'm the lucky one to own my bones uh, with my mother. Lane's end for the word in our 73rd year, and my mother passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, we came to uh, New Hampshire, well, my Blatt family was produced in the 1700s, but my mother was from uh, the Boston, Massachusetts area. And in 1945, my father kept pushing the bat up that Lane's End might be available. And my mother finally gave into it and left the home just back from the ocean with all the facilities of, you know, car, you know, cars, running water, and all that. And she came to Melbourne Village and bought into uh, Lane's End with my father Harvey. And at that time, there was Gavin's Lodges, and there was called a lane going down, and it, the race got the name from Lane's End. And one of the pictures on here shows originally the, the people that originally uh, started Lane's End in 1915 was the Craig family. And that was Edith and Gardner Craig, and they also had Melvin Gardens, and their the home right at the end of uh, opposite the Hansel and Gretel shop was theirs. Edith was a Brewster. And uh, we bought it from them at 45, and our first year of operation was 1946. Uh, with the camp when we bought it was rowboats, some rowboats, some cabins, but there were four large white lodges. And these lodges were built from the uh, hurricane of 38. Those lodges still exist today. We have people in this room that actually stayed in one for quite a while, Heather Mark Smith. Uh, and the, uh, they are still in good working condition because uh, we try to keep them that way. Uh, this is what the lane looked like back then. You can see later on. It's, it basically had a birch type uh, apparatus that made up the sign saying these are cabins, lodge, and the gardener, Craig, and then used to let people come down and camp all day, go for a day uh, swim down the beach and everything. When we uh, took over, my father, uh, the next year, first year we lived here, what is Melvin Village Marina today, the house, that's where we lived the very first year in that home while our house was being built down in Lane's End. Uh, my father at that time built about four more big lodges and then two on the water and three, three up on, on all brown lodges. And they're still in operation today, I suppose. As the camp grew uh, it, over the years, uh, in the 50s, we expanded to opening up a trailer park. Uh, and at that point, uh, my my father was divorced from my mother. He went back to the Navy as an engineer for Pratt & Whitney and Sikorsky, and then went back to Long Island and worked for Republic Fair Child Hill, and he was a design on aircraft. So my mother continued, and I had a stepfather along the way and another one. And my last stepfather was Ray, uh, was Ray Mitchell, was the second one. Ray was, Tom Mitchell was a person in the town here. Tom was a very good friend and helped us a lot with Wayne and as the trailer park grew, it, we went from uh, 10 trailers all the way up to where we ended up with 85 trailers. We ended up with 33 cabins and lodges and a 28-space camping area. The, and when I went to college in, back in 62, after leaving Brewster, 
I wanted to have expand the marina business. So at that point, my stepfather, Myrtle McLeod, who was a, a lawyer by trade, Mac helped me design up what today is Lane's End Marina on the water, which is the docking facility of 54 slips. Uh, I designed that while I was a freshman and sophomore in college, and we built it in my junior and senior year, and since then, expanded it in different ways. The, uh, when I went and drafted in the Army, came back after that in 1970, and expanded the marina business, but also took one portion of the uh, business, because when I came back, we were up to on an average level of about 600 to 700 people on a daily count. And on Labor Day and 4th of July, we could hit 800, possibly 1,000. And the beach itself would be so full that people would come down in the mornings and they would put tiers of chairs or things back from the beach. I interrupt. Did these people come for a week? For oh, the season, or? Uh, we had both. Uh, the majority of the ones in the, in the, uh, in the trailer park uh, were all, we were open May 15th, October 15th, and they were basically seasonal customers. Then we also had some of the big lodges used to go out by the week. My mother had a cleaning crew and herself. She put an hour upon hour in there. As a matter of fact, we have one person that chauffeured my mother in this house, in the place right here, Heather Smith, worked for my mother while I was in the Army and worked for her afterwards. And even Mark, when he got out of the the uh, Coast Guard worked one year and helped me out. So uh, it's we've had a family upon family go through lanes, and uh, it's been a real reward and a real chore. But uh, over the years, there's I know I can't even probably count the number of people that were lanes and people that have become Melbourne Village, Tufton Borough residents. Uh, it was a huge boost to the local economy. We had just made a tremendous dis difference. We, we used to get, out there yeah. compared to what happens nowadays. Yes. It's a whole different uh, setup in, in the tourist. Now, we had a little store that Heather worked in the store. We had a store that basically uh, handled more ice cream and milk than any other store almost on this side of the lake because of the number of campers and the number of people that went through it. And uh, it was originally on the beach. It moved up into the rec hall, which where our big house was. It burned down when I was at Brewster. And uh, even today, it has the names of different kids. We wouldn't take all the wood out. It still has the names and the years of the different kids. Some of the, uh, the older bathrooms still have some of it, so we paint some of the walls. Uh, when we built the dock, it's a crib dock. It's 150 feet out, 150 feet on the end. And Milty, Uncle Milty, being built the dock. Milton was known for building some of the best crib docks all through Tufton Borough, all the way to Mopro. And it was built, the year it was a soft ice, so it was built on our beach. And that meant a uh, crib dock, if you don't know what it is, they take logs, they hew, hand hew them, took all the bark off, and then would build actually a log cabin effect with the cribs, the sections, and they would bolt them. Milty would not use a power tool, period. And his assistant, which many of you people would know, was Fred Sargent. Fred's still here, still alive. Fred would be down, and they would be all hand augers these extendable bits, put it all together, and then he floated it out around to the point, and then Reg Colby of H.C. Colby and Son, which was Reg's father, Sam, filled it with stone, and then Milty started putting the deck on. Well, it got late in the spring, and I wanted to get the pile driver in to put pilings in to put the slips in, and Milton was falling behind schedule, and I brought down a power saw <laughs> and hooked it up, and he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to trim the boards because we're getting behind. This really, because he was one, everything had to be done by hand. And when we took Les Roberts, who had one of the larger cranes on the lake, we had to put the piling in. And I said, Les, we're going to drive it out on the dock. And he actually drove the dock, uh, both the cranes, this big crane, out on the dock. And Milton's eyes just dropped with a jaw and turned the crane. And it didn't even move the dock at all. But until he dropped the hammer, which is when they lifted up and pounded, then it made a noise, and I said, well, we can't do it. Milton would be too upset. <laughs> so we took it off, and they got a barge and drove the pilings with the barge. Is the, uh, when I came back from the service, it was uh, mother had people everywhere. She would actually give out our bedroom when we were kids <laughs> and rent it, and we'd have to camp out in the back. Uh, because when we first came here, the first few years after my, step my father left, Marion Roby, 
was the one that actually helped us through the winter. She actually let mother go take anything she wanted, put it on the slip, and you pay it back in the summer. And Marion was a great help to many people, I'm sure, that lived in the town that way. And as we, when I came back from the service in the 70s, it was decided the place was too big. We had too many people, and we decided to downsize. So at that point, we made choices of subdividing it and selling it. We made the choice of uh, taking it and kind of minimizing it, or one of the ones I wanted to do was to put in double wide retirement homes. And my mother's comment was, I don't want a lot of old, old people here. <laughs> so needless to say, the next thing was condominiums, and we broke off a section, 5.7 acres, 300 feet of uh, property, and put in 15 condominiums, which are in operation today, and they're owned by the people, and they have their own association. Uh, since then, uh, we've modernized some of the cottages. There's still some very some of the original cottages, the smaller cabins, we still have there. Some of the families, one of them that goes through town here all the time, Blue Ridge Landscape, Skip Cope, his family, Cal Cottage, is still at Lane's End. Uh, one that Jack, that uh, Jackie Curdo, and uh, a number of people, Mark and Heather, still have that cottage today, even though they built their own home on a section of what was the lab farm. <laughs> Three acres plus or minus, right, Mark? <laughs> and we're now in phase three right now. Uh, as of the end of this month, my service and storage facility will be sold to my service manager. We will still maintain Lane's End, Lane's End Marina, and that all of the resort part down below. But it's come to a point where my wife said it's time to back off. And this young man is uh, he's intelligent. Uh, he's taught, taught the Mercury course over at uh, the tech school. The tech school wanted him full time. So we had to make a decision very quickly this year. And uh, I'm very pleased to have a young man like this. There, as you know, around the lake, slowly the marinas have been getting eaten up by the Irwins, by the Goodhues. And Melvin, Matt's done a wonderful job down here. Matt has bought Ambrose Cove and he expanded over us. But slowly, what's happening to a lot of the throughout the country, smaller marinas that are operating and doing well are being eaten up by the large marinas. And I just did not want, after putting myself in, in that from 1970, 48 years in expanding my marina, I wanted to have someone that would be young and could carry it on. And uh, I'm pleased to have this young man carry on the heritage of the Lanes End. Uh, I could go on with stories there forever because we had so many good people there. And one quality my mother had for 60 years that she was there, we'll have a lot of different pictures here. This is different uh, people at the beach area. Uh, this happens to be my grandmother lad here in uh, Byron Lad, my grandfather's Chris Craft, and I still have that boat. It's in the boat shed right now. It's 1926 Chris Craft. And this is Lane's End Beach. This is every year we had uh, parades. We always had every Labor Day had uh, kids swimming races and games. And that these are the games behind the rec hall here. So there are a number. Uh, this happens to be uh, my Allen's rowboat and myself and one of the campers out there. And she used to, if you kids, if you could swim from a certain point on her beach to one of the rafts out there, you were allowed to use the canoes and the rowboats. But otherwise, you couldn't. And that was my Allen. She was. A wonderful lady and her uh, daughter a lot of you still know her today still plays instruments and uh, Phyllis and uh, you can hear her still even lately you can hear the flute flute you can hear her playing down at the cottage down from us and Lane's End actually there they were the first they were the second one to buy parts of Lane's End the first were the Fredericks which was actually Bianello it's the Fredericks family trust today going down the road and then the Allens bought their lot Pop Allen and he owned a shoe business down in the lower part of New Hampshire. And they bought it, and the first years that we were there, they had the rights to be able to go down our road, and so they built their road where Meredith Clark, Stanley, where she lives today, that road is Allen Lane. That, uh, when they built the lane, then they gave up the rights of going through Lane's End. But uh, I had one other thing here on the, after 60 years, uh, I would like to, we made up a, my mother, we held a, a reunion, we held a reunion every year, a matter of fact, for years, that was always held in mass, you see. Everyone at Lane's End that still was there, we made, my wife made a composite of all the old pictures and put them together, and most of the people that were at Lane's End have this. 
and this is the one that hung in my mother's house, and I would like to believe it was in the in the history of Ross society last for the last month. Nice. I came last week, last month, to give this talk because, but I was here a month early. <laughs> and this, if I might have a hand, just to hold one side. This was the last party when my mother had put in 60 years of running Lane's End. And it was held at the rec hall, and a lot of everyone was invited back. And shortly, it wasn't shortly after that that uh, she passed away that, that next year. So she put in 60 long years, and she was probably, for women of their days, was one of the few women that uh, was an entrepreneur and ran a business and brought up two children, my sister and I. Along with my stepfathers, but uh, she brought up some men too. <laughs> so, I thank you very much. So, David, I remember uh, going with my father in the summer to get a block of ice down uh, like that to make ice cream in the summer. Okay, I should probably explain that. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Uh, Lane's End and Ball Peak always cut their ice together. Ball Peak had an ice house, and I was privileged to, when I was two years, I worked as a ground boy up there. I, was, I had the first nine holes at the golf course when I was 15 and 16. And they had an ice house. We had an ice house. Basically, an ice house, if some of you don't know it, it was a building where the walls are filled with sawdust. And you cut the, uh, the ice that was cut in Melvin Bay, or actually over going towards uh, Ball Peak. They would cut it, take it into Ball Peak, and they'd also bring it up in chutes and put it in our ice house. And as I grew up as a boy, when I first got here on the White Lodges, we had ice boxes. I have one ice box in my showroom over here. And I would deliver at 13, I had a Chevy pickup, and I would go and pull the ice out, wash the sawdust off, and then put an apron on and go around. And all the, and there was originally pitcher pumps, kerosene lamps, and we had and the kerosene lamps were gone by then. Pitcher pumps came later. Uh, now it has running water ups. And uh, we would, I would have to go around and deliver the ice there, but we also had the store had the ice where we sold it to the campers. Uh, one of my campers uh, that was a counselor at the Jewish Boys Camp over on Black Island, he brought the, uh, used to bring the kids every year on canoes, and they'd stay overnight. And he told me later on, I, I never knew, I never recognized his name, was, was the Prof Professor Shreddle. He was a he was a Christian boy in a Jewish boys camp, and they for some reason they got they said they got better control of the kids that way. All these kids mostly are from New York City, and they're still that camp still is in operation today. They have a junior division on the land and the senior division on Black Island. And Hank told me uh, I store his boat and a car, and over the years I got to know him, and he said, "Do you ever remember me bringing the kids over?" And I said, "Not really." So I said, "Why? Why do you want me to know?" He said, "Well, when the kids were there." bed them all down, and he said, we never told you, we went to your ice house, scraped the sawdust back and put our beer on there, and had it after the kids went to sleep. <laughs> That's right. So we, we did have the ice, ice house, and that, that lasted to a point where we no longer had it, and then the, the ice used to come from Moody, Wolfboro, and then it came from Laconia, Laconia Ice, and I think they still do some ice today. Thank I you. also remember the pop-ups. For the the tent, mm -hmm. you know, the people that came in the, and had tents, they had like this pop up um, thing that was that I thought was real cool that they used for their kitchen. Oh yes, yeah. We had we had a, a number of people initially that didn't have cabins that had camps that had military tents, the platforms, and we had the men in the tent, uh, which were out of Manchester, along with the head jailer out of Manchester. And these were guys that fished, and they had between four trees. Campus, campus over and everything, and their whole life was coming from Manchester up to here to fish, and they just loved uh, going out in Melbourne. We used to go out to the first buoy out of the Melbourne River, and we always used to go horn hopping there every uh, every uh, third Friday and Saturday nights, and uh, then they'd take them back, fry them up one of the times. You mentioned uh, Tom Mitchell. I knew him when I first got here. He was one of the more entertaining, happy people I have met. What was his relationship to you now? Uh, he, well, my stepfather was Ray Mitchell, oh. and Ray was the older brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, but Tom used to, Tom was a worker. Yeah, Tom would be was, down there. Tom worked. would be down there with his father and helping mother, and Ray would be out driving the boat with the, uh, taking the water skiers. And skiers. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Tom was a Tom was a very hardworking man and a nice nice person. Yeah. And his wife, 
eventually was the principal at Tufton Borough School. Thank you very much. I'm BG Hodges. Yay! And let's see. Probably up here. It'll probably warm up in a little bit. Good. I have my notes. So um, the Hodges family got here in 1953. Um, Nancy and Cindy, who are both here, were um, born in Great Falls, Montana. I, however, though I've been here for 65 years almost, was born in San Francisco, hence the shirt. <laughs> but, and no one in here who knows me has ever let me forget that. <laughs> All right, so, okay, the Bill Affair. So Bill Affair was around for... Uh, 12 years. It seems like it was around for a lot longer than that, but it was there 12 years, and where it was was right near Club, Mel Club Melbourne. So right up the little street between, uh, but there's a little cottage on the corner, right in there was a snack bar. And one of the reasons, uh, my dad was a 20-year Army guy. He retired in 1962. This started in 1957, and I was thinking that, my mom had three kids, and, and probably we were so well behaved that, <laughs> that my dad thought my mom needed more to do, I think. <laughs> that was probably, probably it. Um, so, it was also a time in Melbourne Village where a lot of stuff was happening. So, Bob Moulton was doing the Marine Basin. Uh, in there, the bowling alley was built. Carl Hansen had the motel and the airstrip, which is pretty amazing, they have homemade airplanes flying off, and most of the time making it off the runway. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was a great little village which, which had three places to buy gasoline. And I drive by now and I'm kind of like, wow, okay. So, uh, let's see, could I have you hit the, hit, like, the arrow button when I tell you? I, I can do that. Okay, hit one of those little arrow buttons. Um, did that do it? Beginnings! Okay. Um, Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> Some guy. But in the background is Barbara Bottomley, and I think my mother, and I think that might be Hadley Case for some reason, in the snack bar. And my mother used to make really good brownies. Does anyone remember that? Yes. My sister Nancy, I think, has the recipe right and actually brought a batch, right? I mean, that's great. So that'd be really good. Okay, um, this is beginnings, and um, let's skip on. Okay, the building itself. This is where it, this is what it looked like. My mom had a wonderful garden. So you'd sit out on the patio and uh, and look out over the garden and out over the lake, which was great. The snack bar itself was kind of square in shape with a flat roof, really great for New Hampshire. And the <laughs> patio roof was. Corrugated, remember that corrugated fiberglass stuff, that blue kind of translucent stuff that pine needles stuck on and stuff? And, and the, and the uh, patio itself was made of just cement blocks on sand. And one of my jobs was to take, in the early morning, take less toil on a scrub brush, and I would scrub those things, and it was, um, it was a job. So the three Hodges kids used to have different jobs around. Um, I was primarily not a worker in the snack bar. I was a mower, so I would mow stuff. Uh, over time, we had three cottages there. We had uh, and three cottages that were right around there. 
And uh, so there was plenty of stuff to mow. My dad, when he retired, uh, we started more businesses. So in the summer, we had the snack bar going, and a land mail route, and a boat mail route, and a picture frame shop, and three cottages. And our kids' jobs were to hide from work. <laughs> Some of us were better at it than others. My favorite was to know that my sister Cindy, who's here tonight, would get 25 cents for picking up papers up and down up and down Wharf Road, and ended up paying David Peterson 10 cents to do it, and then going over when Dubell's lived there to uh, eat have orange juice and bacon at their house. I thought that was really, really, really smart. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see, let's do the, the next uh, slide. Look at this. Occasionally we got off the premises. So this was an old boat we had, and this is uh, my dad, and then I'm there, and Cindy and Nancy are all there. And you can see the wharf in the background. How many people, just kind of, people, how many people's parents in here worked at the snack bar? Any hands? Okay, some. It seemed like everyone I knew's mom worked at the snack bar over the years. It, it was just, it was, uh, it was a terrific group. Um, and inclu including some guys who worked there too. Um, um, I remember there was one dish that we had called Ray's Derby. There was a guy named Ray who worked there. It was a donut with a scoop of vanilla ice cream and hot fudge on top. Very <laughs> rich. Well, kind of, I think just a regular donut. Now, it's interesting, right next to us, see the sign says Gray Birches up there? That was the house next to us in uh, on Wharf Road, and it was Lena and, and uh, Ralph Drucker's house. And every Saturday, she would make homemade donuts in lard. You know, and, and a lot of Saturdays, for some reason, I ended up there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, moving on. The menu, okay. Um, how many people actually went to the snack bar this in here? Anyone? Okay, some people, okay. Did you have favorite meals or foods? Root beer float, great. Brownie with ice cream. Brownie with ice cream. It was hey, me. Hey, what? My mother liked to have send Heather over to, to get a hamburger. Yep. And they knew when they saw Heather, but one of the girls coming, it was take it out, put it on, Turn it over and send it back to Lane's End. There you go. I'll tell you, Lane's End. Toast the girl. Lane's End supported the, the pathway from Lane's End along there was just all flattened. It was like a highway from Lane's End supported the Villa Fair snack bar. We would we would try to uh, we we were open from Memorial Day to Labor Day. We tried extending it a couple times, never would work. But um, let's see. Oh, I was talking about the, the menu. Um, we never had french fries. There was always chips and beef and ice cream, hot dogs. Now, I had an uncle, Eddie, Eddie McLean, Mc, ran McLean Beef Company in Faneuil Hall back before it was fancy. And if you go to the rotunda now, his sign is still hanging there, McLean Beef Company. That's where we got our beef. We would come in these big drums with dry ice in them, and we would take the dry ice and put it in glasses and throw it in the water and stuff like that, it kind of smoked. Um, and for ice cream, an apology to the Weeks representatives here, uh, came from Keller's Ice Cream in Laconia. So just so you know that, and one of the only places that ever had chocolate chocolate chip ice cream. Pretty amazing. Um, little side note, a lot, um, as I got a little older, I went to work at, at, uh, Ball, at Ball Peak like you did. I would work for Colonel Wilkin as Weston Stevens' assistant and his gardener's assistant. But in the morning, before the snack bar was open, I made luxurious lunches for myself in the snack bar. That was great. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Before, look at this. Okay, here's a question. Who's that on the left? Charlie Allen. Charlie Allen. Picture of my dad wearing this Hungarian hat. My dad at one point went to Hungary for a year. And it came back with this hat. <laughs> and anyway, I wanted to, I was going to preface that, but so good guess. That's, that's Charity's store. What's that? That's right out in front of Marion's store, right? That's the 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was that's Charlie. And that was thrown in there for free. Um, let's see. Other linesman for the telephone. Pardon? He was a linesman for the telephone. <laughs> so the uh, so the snack bar, I'm really amazed. Snack bar only lasted 12 years. What happened generally uh, it, with we kids started moving, and when uh, like I I left high school, went into the army, and uh, Nancy went to uh, a, a school in Boston. And what was happening was my dad would kind of sell off cottages to do things. And I think finally my mom got a little tired of getting up at six in the morning, making brownies working all day, trying to paint. Also, she did a lot of watercolors. Do the snack bar, and one little story is uh, she would get really kind of exhausted and uh, had Nancy go over to the snack bar and make her a hamburger and bring it back to her, and Nancy put a rubber hamburger in it. <laughs> <laughs> so when she bit it through the lettuce and tomato, it was rubber. That was so cool. We were, we were cool to her, too, weren't we? Oh, at times. Nice. <laughs> 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 um, both, both sets of my grandparents went to the same joke shop in Boston, so practical jokes were um, a really big part. My grandmother was, was Julia Martin uh, Mixer, who... Um, owned the house going down to Camp Belknap, which I don't know who owns it now, Roy Johnson owned it, but in her in her 70s, she would haul this plywood silhouette of a deer down into the field so she could watch hunters fire away at it. <laughs> <laughs> we still have, I think Nancy, you still have that paper mache dog do? Well, the like 80 year, 80 year old antique paper mache dog do. This is our family. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is, uh, what happened was, um, I was away, I was in the army, and I uh, got word that the snack bar had been sold, and was moved on a truck, and it went from um, went from where it was down by the lake, uh, up the street, to be parked by the motel. So it went up there, and the Lewises bought it, and they opened it as a snack bar, and it was there for a while, then it gradually turned into an apartment, and gradually, I think the original part of the snack bar is like long gone. It still kind of looks vaguely the same shape, but that was uh, so. That was where it was. It was a an interesting twelve years. And uh, now, any questions? How did you come up with the name? What's up? How did you come up with the name Pillow Bear? I remember seeing like kind of them talking back and forth. Pillow Bear, Pillow. It was like I don't know. It was like probably one of those nights sitting around, like some somewhere on this computer I have. Pictures of like the Hansons and the Hodges and the Moultons, and it was kind of this, it was kind of like group efforts a lot of times, and fueled by alcohol. <laughs> so there was probably you know, probably a bit of that involved. Yes. Based on the bill of fare, oh, bill which was fair. Uh, yes, like, like, like uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, bill of fare. Right here, it just says cruise to the bill of fare. Um, my dad, always the entrepreneur, bought a pontoon boat. My mom painted this little sign. And uh, so we could, like take out like little charter people and like my dad was, seemed to be really good at like doing things that required him to like drive vehicles and like the mail <laughs> and stuff. And uh, he had a CB radio, and we would hear him at Wabi saying KOA seven zero two eight Marine, saying you know to base, and we'd go, he's coming. <laughs> and we'd like, run around and try to do like two hours of chores in like ten minutes. <laughs> and uh, so that would happen. He was the current army, you know, army colonel. <laughs> who uh, could command the troops, but his kids were hard to handle. <laughs> so, anyway, so he was always coming up with ideas. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. No problem. My, my first recollection is when I was perhaps three or four years old. It was a hot summer night. Windows, my grandmother had the windows all open in the house. And I slept in the bedroom next to the workspace in the store. They put me to bed, 
And suddenly I heard this noise. Well, I went downstairs and I said, Father, what is that noise? Oh, that's Marion. She's canceling the mail in the post office. Because he had been hearing it since he was six years old. He knew immediately what it was. But that's my earliest recollection. As you face the store, there were two gasoline pumps, and as was brought up earlier, there were three places that we could get gas. We could get it in the village, uh, but now we can't get it anywhere. <laughs> but anyway, you walked into the front doors, and on the left was the post office. And we have the post office in the museum, which you can look at. You want to look at it because there's something different about it. Uh, the post office we have now, we have little doors with keys, not so. It's glass with the numbers, and you can see what's in the box, but you have to ask. So my grandmother would go get the mail, and I'd go up 52, please, and they'd go to box 52 and give me the mail. Well, that, you want to look at that. It's different. The one section that's on the end is, has doors, but that's from the Mirror Lake Post Office, not the Melbourne Post Office. Now, after you walked in, post office was on the left, it was a long counter, probably from near to the wall. And it would be Marion and maybe Charlie and whoever uh, to wait on you to get your groceries or whatever. At the end of the counter, there was a space you could walk through, and there was the telephone exchange. We have in the museum, you can look, uh, an exact duplicate, it is not the one, but it's an exact duplicate of that switchboard. Someone would sit there, uh, and it would ring, they pull up the wire and plug it in, and number threes, and they would connect you to whatever person you wanted to talk to. In the in the dark at night, Charlie Allen had a cot. He would set it up down there because somebody had to man that telephone. There was a fire or something in the middle of the night. So, uh, but uh, there'd be somebody there, and if they weren't working at the telephone, they'd come over and wait on you and get you what you wanted. To continue further into the back room, there was the cheese. There was a table with big brown cheese and it came in wooden boxes and you had the wooden one of those boxes in the museum. Over the cheese was a thing that looked like a, uh, a lampshade cover that went down. It had a string of a little cable that went up to the ceiling, over a pulley, across another pulley, and down with a weight on it. So they could walk up, pick this up, put it up in the air, and it would stay there, cut the cheese, and then bring the thing back down to keep the mosquitoes or bugs or whatever it might stop. And they were pretty good. If you wanted a pound, they Come pretty darn close to the width that you wanted, or two pounds, or whatever. Uh, in that back room, also, there was a telephone booth which Mary has donated to the society. Uh, it didn't have, a, it wasn't a pay phone, it didn't have a coin mechanism in it. You went to the switchboard and said, I want to call New York so-and-so, and they would connect you, and then when you got done, they'd figure out how much you owe. Later, the bar, they made the uh, telephone booth was moved out onto the porch, but for some reason they didn't like it out there. I think when it was on the porch it had coins, but they didn't last very long. They brought it back inside again. 
Now continuing back to Ethel's way, there was a uh, uh, cooler with wood with water in it with soft, soft drinks in it. It wasn't like the one at Mirror Lake where you had to slide it through slots to get it out. They were just in there loose. And get them out. Continuing towards the road some more with the candy. That was a good place. <laughs> there was all kinds of candy and it was in a glass case and we have the case in the, in the museum. So it was the center of the universe as far as Melvin Village shows. The newspapers came, people came to get them, people came to get their mail, post office, uh, the phone, plus I knew what everything was going on in the town. If there was a fire somewhere, they could bring all the fire department people and get them to come. It was, just, uh, it was just a very lively place. They came to their Sunday papers. The papers would come in big bundles, tied up with string, and the truck would throw them off on the porch, and then people would come and buy their, their Sunday paper. And I was admonished as a child, now don't go over there and waste time and hang around in the store. Marion doesn't want people hanging around. So you went to the store and you did what you had to do and you went home. But uh, it, 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 to me, that was the center of Melbourne Village. It's the social social connection that we don't have today for people, especially elderly people that live alone, that don't have a, don't necessarily have a place to go every day where they can be with other. people. Talk to other people, and that's one of the reasons why I don't want to get into any arguments here tonight. But one of the reasons why the library is important because it's the only place in town where older people can go and feel safe and and be around other people without spending any money. I go to the store all the time. I don't spend any money. <laughs> 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 the, other, the other thing that Marion's store did is it was a babysitter too. Yeah. Because when we came home from school, I would go to the Severances, which is on the corner, and all we had we could go on the, they were ring seven, we'd go over and we'd marry him. When mom gets home, I'm over at the Severances. Yeah. You know? Mother would call and Mary would say, Where's David at? You know, wherever the mom was with a with her whoever the Severances or whoever. But she she had a hold of the whole town. Yeah, and she knew if you were looking for somebody in town, oh, yeah. where they were. Yeah, they were doing. Our phone number was 8 11. Yeah. And I've said before, you, you know, call up and speak to Priscilla Holder or something. And she would say, Well, she's over at so and so's, I'll connect you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Was it every line of the party line? There were no yeah. yes. 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 yeah. I can remember bringing my name in and my yes. grandfather's in. Somebody already on you, so you can listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the next time you come to the museum, go look at the post office, look at the telephone exchange, and there's a lot of other neat stuff in there. You've got there some of the telephones in there, too. Yeah. So, what was, was the role of the Melvin uh, General Store? That was the alternative. That was all about the Coates family. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there was some uh, competition there. Yeah, yeah, they had a little yeah. bit of a meat market there. You know, was had they had some hardware there or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so it was like shoes, shoes. Yeah, yeah, shoes. Yeah, yeah. 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 so Tom Brady. Yeah. 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 yeah, Don Thomas. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's what about the Sullivan's in what, the late 30s? Sullivan's. Yes. And then, yes. and then uh, Don Thomas, Don Thomas came in there and yeah. they ran it and they had a hardware yeah. store in the basement with shoes, clothing, and all that stuff. Well, I'm I'm intrigued because this is a pretty stagnant community, and now there's nothing like that now in the center of Tuckenborough. We still have the general store, and it has the same function that I'm hearing here now. That's right. I wonder why. You guys don't all go to the pine cone? <laughs> 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 I'm 
I'm just wondering why all that collapsed here. I mean, yeah. and it's still I, going I, on I, over in Tampa. Is it just the type of people you got? You got more country people than okay, over so, there. Oh, so you see any elderly <laughs> single women <laughs> uh, going and sitting at the table in the in the center of the grocery store? Well, Billy yeah, Keys, you know, Billy Keys, when I go there. Right. Right. <laughs> 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 And there's, there's a lot of women in this community that have outlived their spouses and that live alone and, and don't aren't going to go to the pine cone and sit at the bar by themselves, or they're not they're not going to you know go into the center Tuftonboro store and sit at the table and talk to the guys there, you know, um, and and so they. Need so you're saying that primarily the, uh, the other two places were filled with women? <laughs> no. If that were the no, case, I don't see how they closed. <laughs> you, can, you, can have a, you have a connection. I, I, I know this is off the subject, but I, I run a soup kitchen in Santa Harbor. And nine out of every ten people that come to the soup kitchen are elderly women who live alone and have no social connection. And they're not there for the food. They're there for the social connection. Yes, but to answer your question, I think these two stores or buildings in Melbourne, um, Marion decided to close them. The post office moved out, moved over here, and these people over the years sold, and somebody else bought, and Puppy Jeremy bought it. It's easier now for people. Like I'm so used to. Draw, I mean, I work for Wolfboro. It's like I always feel like Tuck Girl kind of like. Well, no one most things. I drive to Wolfboro to shop. It's kind of like what yeah. they decided. You know, kind of. In our I really <laughs> stop. When John sold and built that store, it was more of a, it was more, he had more hardware. He had a lot of hardware. When Jackie and I owned the store, there were still shoes and barrels downstairs. Oh, yeah. Store. And then when John Thomas, John Thomas owned the store, uh, he had a chainsaw business. And he told me one day that we sold hamburgers. We never put any in the case, we only ground it and grind it when somebody came in and ordered it. But John Thomas was telling me one day that John Sullivan told him, Oh, you don't believe me on a hamburger. <laughs> and Don, Don's going along. And he's like, he's all that much <laughs> so, I kept thinking about it. All of a sudden, it dawned on me. John Sullivan, he Right by his meat counter, he had a barrel of kerosene. So he'd sell somebody a gallon of kerosene, and then someone would come in, order a pound of hamburger, and he'd sell a pound of hamburger. So he had the kerosene, <laughs> <laughs> kerosene on his hand. Fiery hamburger. Hamburger <laughs> 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 so, John Sullivan, he, he had a store in Sandwich before he came here, and every noontime, there was a door that went upstairs to the apartment in the store. And every noontime, uh, after his wife had had lunch, he would go up and have a nap. But in the store, nothing was marked. They didn't mark anything. So a guy would come in. One guy, a guy came in and was looking for a, a street sweeping door. So John had a couple hanging up, and the guy said, that's what I want right there. He says, how much of those? This is why she didn't have a clue. So she goes over and opens the door and steps up and yells upstairs. John, how much of those street brooms you got hanging up there? John will yell back down to her. Who's it for? So it had a different price depending on who was in the box. I was just thinking that some of the changes that happened in life had to do with there were almost families with young children 
for several many years. And that that sort of changed. And maybe that has something to do with the businesses. Well, I think they couldn't survive. I think they struggled to get the meals that they needed. Um, and it's, it was so sad to see. They would they keep watching them give it up. Well, they had to put it in Yeah, I didn't last that year. 